but you will have your uh... uh yes i'm going to share my screen now okay guys and we are now officially opening up yeah i'm doing good luck broadcast okay <laughs> Okay, we've started getting people in. That's fantastic. <coughs> you all can see my screen, yeah? Yes. No, no, no. No, not yet. Okay. Yes. Yes. yes, now. Okay, super. All right, so we've got people coming in. So without further ado, we will start uh, uh, to our episode five uh, of the Technal Facade webinar series. Bonjour, guten Morgen, salam alaikum, namaste to all our attendees from Europe to Middle East to India. It's such a pleasure to host all of you on our episode five of the Technal Facade webinar series. Uh, today is our season one finale, and we're super excited to walk you through to this uh, wonderful uh, last edition of our first episode. First season, it is on complex facade and post COVID-19. Today, um, before I start, I would like to first extend my gratitude to all the frontline workers who've been tirelessly working in the hospitals, in the petrol stations, in the supermarkets, helping us and fighting this battle with us and helping us to stay safe and stay uh, healthy at the same time. So a little bit about Technal before we, we, we start. Uh, we are a Hedro brand. We are present in more than 70 countries. Uh, we are present across five continents with the 60 years of experience. We celebrate our 60th year anniversary this year. Uh, we like to call ourselves the architect's partner for the most complicated challenges. And we also like to be called as an innovation and design expert. Uh, the, to give a brief to all our panelists and also to all the attendees, today is our fifth uh, uh, the fifth uh, episode. So far, we have completed four episodes with 10 speakers, over 1,800 attendees. We cover topics on digitalization, sustainability, circular economy, high-rise facades, fire and life safety design. So we have covered a wide spectrum of, of uh, topics. And today, we come to probably the most important and significant topic uh, which we'd like to, uh, everybody's interested to also understand how the facade industry is going to evolve in the coming days. How are we going to see the natural evolution of our industry? And for that, uh, I am very excited and I'm super thrilled for my panel. Uh, today, my panel is uh, almost having an experience of 200 years in this room. I would like to first um, uh, introduce to, uh, to all you attendees, our panelists. Firstly, we have with us Dr. Christian Schulz. He is the Director in Economics uh, of the Economics Team at City, City Research. He is City's Lead Economist for Germany, the UK, and uh, Switzerland. He is based in Frankfurt, and prior to joining City, uh, he was the Market Infrastructure Expert at the European Central Bank for three years and a Management Consultant at the Boston Consulting Group. Uh, he is also a BSc degree uh, holder in financial economics from the University of St. Andrews and also a doctorate in economics uh, in the, from the Wall Street from Hamburg University. We are super excited. Thank you very much, Dr. Christian, for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you here with us. Uh, secondly, we have our a very good uh, friend and uh, probably one of the most important facade consultant in South Asia. We have with us Mr. Mahesh Armagam, who is the regional director of South Asia Mainhart. He, Mr. Mahesh provides uh, strategic leadership as the director for Mainhart South Asia facade consultancy business. He has been in the facade industry for more than 22 years. His experience ranges from aluminum glazing systems to precast concrete facades, BIPV, uh, LED enhanced systems, and stone 
stone cladding. Uh, at, Ma at Main Hut, Mahesh has acquired experience in aspects of facade design, including curtain walls, glass walls, aluminum and stone claddings, canopies, and stylized. And most of all, he is one of the most well-renowned uh, consultants for, for building envelopes in the South Asian markets. Mr. Mahesh, thank you so much for joining us for this important session today. Along with this, we have Mr. Henry Gomez, the president of Hydro Building System. He has more than 36 years of experience in facade and fenestration industry. Mr. Henry Gomez is the global president of Hydro Building Systems. Thank you so much for joining us today, sir. It's a pleasure to have you in the discussion. Now, I also want to introduce our fourth panelist, Mr. Jean-Marc Louvisito, who is the Vice President for Hydro Building Systems in Asia. Mr. Jean-Marc has a wide variety of experience from technical to R&D, and he has been uh, in the industry for more than 40 years, and he brings with him a wealth of knowledge and expertise in the business of facade and fenestration. And for our uh, final panelist, Mr. Sam Robinson, who is the Managing Director for Hydro Building Systems in Middle East and India. He has more than 25 years of experience in the field of construction. He's a civil engineer by profession and uh, has, got, uh, has been with the Hydro organization for more than 15 years. We are super excited to have you, Mr. Sam Robinson, also in today's panelists. Along with our panelists, we have my co-host, Isha Sharma, who is uh, heading uh, marketing and communications in India. Thank you so much, Isha, for managing our session today. And before I pronounce the event to a digital start, I would like to have a quick housekeeping rule. We have two tabs for all our panelists today. One is the Q&A panel and one is the chat panel. Please use the Q&A panel to uh, populate all your questions. We're going to be taking questions at the end of the presentations today. And subsequently, we will have also interactions during this time. So thank you again, panelists, for joining us today. And we're going to kickstart our presentations on complex facade and post-COVID. But to, to orient our presentation to direct us in the right way, we always need to have an economist to give us uh, a lead through of, of what is expected in the region today. For this, I first uh, invite Dr. Christian Schools to give us, and uh, uh, sorry, before we go to Dr. Christian, I would like to invite uh, uh, Mr. Henry Gomez, uh, who is gonna give us an update on hydro building systems and the current COVID situation today. So I hand over the platform digitally to uh, Mr. Henry. Mr. Henry, the floor is yours. But for was, uh, could you share what, what have been uh, the surprise for you about this COVID situation? And uh, my job today is to manage and to lead uh, a company. I'm not an economist, uh, I'm not an engineer, but I'm leading a company of uh, some thousand employees all over the world. And uh, I would like to share with you what have been uh, surprising me a lot and uh, what potentially will influence the months to come in, the, in, this, uh, in, our, in our industry. And, uh, the building and construction, but perhaps a bit wider. Can you share the screen, uh, Arvin? Well, here it is. The, the first topic, uh, which has been very surprising uh, for us, is uh, we are speaking since years about the global war. Sorry, Henri, uh, I, I would like you to share your screen. Uh, we don't see the presentation. We don't see the presentation. I see it. Just have to press on share screen. Um, yeah. okay now, yes, perfect. Uh, if you just go back to the first slide and full screen. Thank you very much. So the first thing, which is a. Uh, I'm, I am a global actor. I'm, I'm traveling over the world and, uh, and I'm uh, working all over the world with uh, my teams. And uh, the first thing which was potentially a strong shock is uh, this difference we speak about globalization, but uh, at the end, uh, everything which is culture is very local. And uh, I, am, I am a French guy living in Europe, but only in Europe, the difference between North and South have been uh, enormous. Not from a COVID perspective, because COVID was more or less infecting people and the country more or less by the same way, but the way our countries, our leaders have been reacting. We have had over the last two months, more or less uh, 
Sweden and a country like Denmark or Holland, which have been working completely normally with a logic of no confinement or very limited confinement, making a business as usual, distancing, yes, some constraints, but not too, too much. And the logic of, let's see uh, if everybody has an illness, at the end we are, we are safe. We have seen uh, some German speaking countries and some Nordic countries, uh, I would say confined, a lot of constraints, but uh, business never stopped. We, we have a, we are beating record of uh, building installation project facade at the moment in, uh, in Germany or in Switzerland, while we are in the middle of uh, a sanitary crisis. And as the opposite, we have seen uh, we have seen the south of Europe completely affected, uh, business stopping very fast, people are willing to stay at home to be more secured, and, uh, and we have seen our Italian plant completely stopped because of some law and because of some people and some behavior in the industry of the construction, the same thing for Spain and the same thing for countries like France. So we, we clearly have a, a, a big difference. And in the middle of Europe, we have a Belgium and, and UK, which have a, a mixed behavior between the North and the South. So culture, it remains something which is extremely impressive to see in this crazy situation of, of COVID. We speak about the world is global. And, uh, and we have another point, which is that uh, the, the social is very local. I, I, am, I am leading a, a company with workers everywhere and employees everywhere. And uh, we have a situation where we have been obliged to make some uh, temporary layoff uh, of people. We have been obliged to make people moving on holidays and uh, trying to adapt to the type of volume we have had, which have been very fluctuating during this uh, period of time. And, uh, and the world is strange. Uh, is it really a justice? I'm not so sure. but. Uh, this will, it will influence the future. In Germany, unemployment means uh, you can put people unemployed temporarily only 30% of the time, maximum. 70% they must work, or you have to, to definitely lay out people. In, in countries like France, you can have people temporarily lay off and they have 85% of, of their salary. Whatever the salary is, small or big. Uh, you go to a country like uh, Italy or Spain, or you have a you have 85% uh, of salary is paid, but uh, maximum is, uh, is 1,000 euro or 1,200 euro. So a lot of difference. In, uh, in Spain, we have, been, uh, we have been requested to make people uh, at home, not working for two weeks, but uh, being uh, paid by us by, by using these hours to be compensated to be used later. So we have been facing a lot of difference. But uh, if we speak about Asia, we have had some countries who have been uh, completely stopped for, for some weeks. and. Uh, no compensation so we just have to find a way or to have people on holidays or to support them the best way we can because if they're out of the company they have absolutely no protection and uh, if we move to the us i think it's probably the, the worst place for social perspective in the world where uh, we have had we have some of employees in the us and uh, a lot of them have been uh, in temporary layoff and, and they have no protection so we are nothing so in the situation we have had a we are having the choice as a company to continue to maintain our social security and protection for the employees, even if they're not any more employees of the company. So the, the world is very uh, socially different and we can speak about globalization, but uh, socially is a lot of difference. Another point when we speak about the world is global and, uh, and we see what, what, we can, what we can do with that. Borders are back. When we speak about uh, this situation and, uh, and we speak about uh, globalization with this COVID situation everything is back to uh, borders closing and this type of things uh, you know what uh, our main, main uh, place in, in, uh, in Middle East is in Bahrain and uh, traveling through Saudi Arabia was impossible uh, because borders are closed and then we have a uh, we have some projects in, uh, in some countries which are made by workers in other countries impossible to travel borders are closed London is a, is a fantastic place at the moment with a lot of projects ongoing, but most of the installations are coming from people come from East of Europe, but uh, impossible. And uh, we, we have seen some, uh, some of our fast company which were using a private airplane to bring some people from the company to install projects in, uh, in, in London, in Europe. So borders have been uh, extremely closed everywhere. I am a French guy living in France, and uh, I must go to visit my team in Germany, in Europe part of Europe, but borders are closed. I mean, French people cannot go to Germany and Belgian people cannot go to Germany, but uh, from Holland it's possible. So there is, there is a, 
we are speaking about globalization, but whether there is something uh, changing and uh, something uh, special happening, the first reaction of everybody is uh, closing the border. And at the moment, we have our, our boss of China, is um, a French lady, uh, but living in Sweden, and clearly uh, going to China for the moment is impossible. And uh, clo borders are closed. You cannot even go there and say, make, make me a test or make me in a, in a, in a, for two weeks in quarantine. It's impossible. We cannot go there. So borders and uh, closing everything and uh, going back to our base is looking to be a, a tendency which is extremely natural even in our days of uh, globalization. Globalization and uh, back to normal, back to local. I mean, uh, I, I am a, I'm a company which have employees and uh, we have resulted to work in most of our plants in the world. And uh, we have been obliged to uh, organize for the safety of the people and to buy, uh, to find to have masks and to have protection and to have a product for cleaning the hands and all these type of things you all know in the world. But uh, what people are saying, say, but the virus is coming from China. And, and that's a bit stupid, but uh, next time it will be for another place. But the uh, mask is coming from China. And uh, in our industry, we aren't making too much portion of component in China, but uh, but in the car industry, where we have a lot of components coming to China. And uh, for our equipment in our plant, a lot of things are coming from China. And these have been a leitmotiv for me over the last weeks in our activity to try to find everything to produce normally, to protect our people normally. And most probably in the TV, when you look at it, it's always the same message. And this, uh, we, this dependence will not will not last. Uh, impossible for people like me uh, to see my all of my employees, their safety and the is depending from uh, too far away. I mean, we must be able to be uh, locally more strong to to protect ourselves. Uh, and this is a general topic for industry, for leaders like me, but for our politicians and, and the world in general. And another point which. Uh, Surprised me, or and, and my origin over the last uh, over the last months is that uh, we have had two months without visiting customers, and uh, and we are a company which is uh, working with architects and, uh, and with final companies and uh, technically and supporting for project and uh, and no no chance no visit and so we have we have discovered what is webinar and I think today is an example, but also working in, uh, in video conference. And we are making a business as usual, more or less, in most of the place uh, without any more visit. We just restart this week to make uh, to make visit. It was a rule in our group not to do that till last week, and now we are making it only for essential case. But uh, but this has been a fantastic experience, and and something we have discovered how much we were used to work in a way which is uh, potentially uh, old-fashioned, and we things will change. We have had a. Uh, two months without business travel. I, I, I'm used to travel uh, over the world uh, four to five days a week. And uh, since two months, I'm not doing it. And a lot of my leaders have the same situation. And we have been learning how to work in video. And uh, it's different. It cannot be 100% of the time, but it will be much more than in the past. Technologically, it's extremely stable, much more than it was some, some, some months ago or some years ago. And this will change the perspective in a company like us. And for most of you, it was the same, home office. We were used to have, uh, in some of our organization, home office potential possible for our employees one day a week, two days a week for certain function. If people want to do it, if it's pragmatically possible, but we have been able to work for two months in some area at 100% of normal business and uh, without any people in our office. And, uh, and this has been uh, working quite okay. It's not possible to think it's 100% full-time good, sustainable, but it's changing the game. But uh, what, what I want to share is that uh, it's, it's a fantastic evolution and which will be, we will see more fit in the future, but uh, we also have seen um, a lot of problems, uh, people in difficulties. Uh, motivation to go back to office is extremely complicated. Uh, some people are very afraid to go back. Some people are actually motivated. Some people are, have been uh, very strongly perturbed psychologically by, by the situation to be alone or in a different mode of work and not socializing, they socialize in the work. So this is a new way to work, but uh, this has had also a strong influence on a lot of employees and uh, of our company. And, uh, and the process now we are going back to the office by rotation to make people a step by step back, but keeping the social distance. And uh, we see a lot of difficulty for a lot of people. 
the world is, is global. And, uh, and uh, so we have been speaking about sustainability but at this moment. It's impressive how much people speak more about sustainability and, and, and being green. Uh, I mean, we never have seen so few pollution in our big cities in the world. We never have seen uh, animals going back in our cities. I, I was impressed to see uh, recently on a, on a, on a, on a TV, uh, I think it was a duck in, on the Champs Elysees. Impossible to imagine in normal time. But uh, we have been uh, seeing in, uh, in some place of the world people which have been spending two months in a small apartment in, a, in the center of the big city, looking at the internet to buy uh, houses a bit further, but uh, to change the lifestyle. So this uh, environmental problem, this confinement, I've been making this type of things extremely visible for everybody. And uh, during that period of time, we never have had so much requests for our sustainable solution like Circal, the aluminum recycle, never ever. So behind this situation, uh, the behavior of people have changed. The visibility of sustainable problem and the Earth's evolution have been even more strong, even stronger. And the requests we see from everywhere about sustainability will increase uh, most probably very strongly. I think uh, for us, if we speak about business, uh, we were completely working normally in January, February. We have seen wide our business decreasing by 20% in March. We have seen our delivering and activity in April uh, decrease by 50%. We are on May on a trend to be uh, at the end of the month at minus 20%. And uh, our business order entry pipeline activity uh, make us think that we will be back in, in June at 100%. So we will have had uh, three months uh, very specific, but uh, most of the activity of our window facade uh, business is looks to be uh, close to back to normal within the next uh, the next weeks. We had the moment in a uh, Mid-May, we had more or less at the moment at 80% uh, of normal activity uh, uh, compared to previ previous period. So we hopefully be uh, at 100% in June. So in the building industry, after a lot of things which have been stopped, building sites stopped in some area and some, some other area, not, not so much, we are seeing that we are close to be back in normal, but uh, it will be different. And uh, I suppose our inter, inter people, other people who are going to speak after me will discuss and explain more a bit about that. I wanted to share a bit uh, my experience of leader, what I have seen, which was have been making me uh, shocked over the last uh, over the last months. And uh, just one point to finish. Uh, I think that period of time for 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 me and for my team, we are part of a group which have a strong values uh, and uh, and this care, courage, and collaboration, which are the basic of our value, have been uh, extremely extremely strong, extremely powerful and useful at that, that period of time. And uh, and I think. Uh, as leaders of uh, organization, having strong values is very important. And uh, we never fully realize when time are okay, but when time are complicated and, uh, and the situation is different, extremely powerful and important. So that's what I wanted to share with you. And uh, thank you very much for listening. And uh, I hope you will see, you will learn more from other people now. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Henri, for giving us an overview of the Hydro building system position during this COVID-19 uh, uh, transition period, as I would like to say it. Uh, it was very insightful. Uh, thank you very much for giving us uh, this uh, overview. Uh, with this, I would now like to segue into talking more about the global macroeconomic situation and also talk to us a little bit about how the banking industry is pursuing this current situation. For that, um, I would like to now invite uh, Dr. Christian uh, Schools, who is uh, um, our uh, special panelist speaker also today, uh, coming from uh, the City uh, Bank uh, uh, in today's presentation. So with that, I now request uh, Dr. Christian to, um, to take the floor digitally. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Arvind. I hope you can already hear me uh, and um, I'll start my video now. Yes, please. Very good. Uh, and I will start my um, screen share as soon as I can, um, as soon as Henri is uh, off. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Arvind, uh, for the uh, invitation and introduction. Uh, and also thank you very much, Henri, for giving uh, some of your views there. I think some of the 
things that you said, for instance, about uh, how different countries have responded in different ways, I think that you will see in some of my charts uh, as well. Um, so I think that's, that's, that's going to be uh, quite a nice uh, link. But um, as, as you said, what I'm going to focus on it to a little bit degree is how bad it currently is, but mostly on what the recovery uh, may look like and what may be the downside risks while um, we're waiting to get back to normal uh, and hopefully give you an idea how that will uh, also impl um, implicate uh, your industry and your industries and your, the countries which, from which you've uh, dialed, um, dialed in. So uh, let me try and share my screen first. I think it's still blocked by, um, by Henri. Jean-Marc, could you please uh, stop your screen stop. share? Yeah, could you stop your screen share, please? Just cross the TV icon on the right. Stop sharing. On the Zoom tab at the bottom, Zoom, there, there would be a green tab where TV is there you, and a cross button to press that. Yeah. Great. Very good. So now I can um, hopefully share my screen. So you should be seeing a slide from City Research uh, Observations on COVID-19 Recovery uh, Alphabet. Hopefully you can see that uh, so that I can start my uh, quick presentation. Um, what we're observing globally is the deepest global recession in living memory. Um, as the da data is starting to flow in from the first quarter already. We've already had Chinese data, which was unprecedented. We've had uh, GDP data from some uh, advanced economies such as Italy, such as Spain or France, where GDP shrank by 5%, even though the lockdown was just in the last few weeks of the quarter. This morning, an unprecedented fall in output in the UK uh, as well. Uh, it's, it's, it's very clear that we're observing the deepest global recession uh, in living memory. Um, as we get out of this, um, clearly the financial markets where uh, I usually um, operate will play some role. Uh, and to us, it's as economists in the financial markets, it's extremely interesting to see how well uh, financial markets have worked and how much they've already recovered uh, from the initial drops. But obviously, uh, real factors, real economic factors are going to dominate the speed of return to normalcy. Um, what we struggle with is uh, sectoral differences uh, in this recovery. Um, we know that some sectors will be bouncing back quite quickly. I think Henri very uh, well showed how uh, construction, how uh, manufacturing in particular, uh, could see indeed a V-shaped uh, recovery. But we also know that if we were talking in a context where we were all restaurant workers, for instance, uh, we probably wouldn't expect a V-shaped but more a J or L-shaped uh, recovery or a Nike swoosh, as some people call it. Uh, and uh, I, you know, the, it goes without saying that um, we could see another dip if there's a second wave of infections, in which case we'd end up with a W-shaped uh, recovery and the recovery would be inverted marks. So that's what we mean by recovery alphabet. Nobody knows what it's going to look like. It's going to be V-shaped in some sectors, uh, J or U-shaped in others, uh, right. and perhaps even W-shaped uh, if we get another wave of uh, in infections. Um, important is that depending on which letter of the alphabet you, you go through for the recovery, it has implications for the real economy uh, as well as for financial markets. But before I go into the actual forecast, I'm going to um, show you a few, I think, interesting charts based on Google's uh, mobility uh, data, which gives you an idea of how bad uh, social distancing and lockdown measures are affecting um, activity at the moment. You can't exactly translate this data into GDP forecast, but it is still uh, interesting. So the first one is uh, my colleagues in, uh, in Asia have uh, used global, um, uh, Google mobility data uh, to um, calculate uh, activity levels um, uh, on different days compared to normal. And as you can see here, it's ordered 
uh, by what happened on the 2nd of May, so two weeks ago. Uh, and you can see that um, the, the most normal activity in this quite wide ranging sample on that particular day was in South Korea uh, and a few other um, East and Southeast Asian uh, economies, Taiwan, um, Hong Kong were quite normal as well. Uh, Sweden, I think Henri mentioned it, uh, has a quite relaxed approach to uh, the COVID-19 outbreak, which means that activity there is still running at about 20, uh, 80%, um, which obviously still means 20% lower than normal, but uh, much better than elsewhere. You see some of the big economies, Germany and the US, uh, around about 75% um, of normal uh, levels. Uh, and then as, um, as Henri already mentioned, Southern Europe um, or the UK, you see more towards the bottom of the range here where activity uh, on the 2nd of March at least was around 40% of normal on these, um, on these measures. And you can see the remaining economies uh, in between. What I think is interesting and which I hope you can see in this chart is that it differs a little bit by um, what people are actually doing. Uh, we split returning to work. Um, so if you like supply, um, you know, you, people going back to the office or going back to the factory to produce what they normally produce. Uh, we differ that from returning to play. So uh, people doing things that they don't have to do, but which are extremely important for consumer demand uh, in economies. Uh, starting with, um, with the advanced economies, uh, so you're starting here with the, with the US, um, you can see that uh, there is some improvement. So um, the presence at workplaces, according to Google Mobility data, has gone up since the end of March, where it was minus 40% to something like minus 30%. Uh, also, rail travel seems to have gone up from minus 50 to minus 35%. Um, if you look at return to play, it's not too bad in the US. You've gone, uh, in terms of retail, from minus 47 to minus 34. And in terms of shopping, grocery and farmeries, pharmacies, you've gone up from uh, minus 20 to uh, minus 4%. Uh, a few other countries which look uh, good, again, Canada, um, Germany uh, in particular. In Germany, you can even see that grocery pharmacies are now above normal. Um, so there's a bit of a recovery happening there or, or already. So not just uh, norm normality, but even a bit of a return. The same applies to Norway uh, there towards the bottom. The dark red, again, you see still see in Southern Europe, although uh, when it comes to shopping, it seems that in France and in um, in France and in uh, Italy, you do have, and in Spain, you do have some recovery uh, there. So uh, that's where the data comes from. If I move over to uh, emerging markets, it's less dark red there. Uh, so that's mainly because some of the Asian countries that I mentioned before are doing relatively well. South Korea, extremely well. Taiwan, extremely well. These countries are being praised for the response to COVID uh, overall. But there are also some outliers. And one of them I've been told is quite interesting to a lot of the audience, uh, India, which has an extremely severe um, lockdown and extremely severe um, social um, uh, impact on, on activity. Uh, there and uh, there's relatively little evidence that this is improving. In fact, it seems to be um, that uh, it actually got worse between the 29th of March and um, and the um, the second of uh, May, which probably reflects the the delays there. Uh, Turkey is another one which is quite uh, concerning. Argentina, uh, another country which is uh, quite deep in the red. Uh, so these are the the, this is an important driver of our forecast, uh, I would say, to which I get now. So these are the numbers that City is currently forecasting in terms of GDP growth and inflation for 2020, 2021, and 2022. Now, these numbers are nothing that I have ever seen before. I've been uh, an economist uh, in the ECB, as was mentioned, and at various um, investment banks for uh, nearly 15 years now. I have never, not even during the global financial crisis, seen anything like the numbers that we're currently forecasting. Global, the global economy we expect uh, will shrink this year by uh, more than 3%. That's uh, you know, unprecedented in uh, living memory uh, outside wartime, global, um, global um, wartime. Um, and uh, you can see advanced economies we ex expect to shrink by 5%. Uh, emerging markets as a whole also by 0.5%. Uh, you see some of the countries, Germany, uh, France, Italy, uh, nearly get to double digit declines in GDP this year, also the UK. Uh, but, uh, and I think the profile that uh, Henri showed there before, this 
almost entirely happens in the second quarter. So that's where we expect uh, GDP to shrink by anything between 10 and 20% in most of these economies. Um, then by the end of this quarter, and many economies will be much, much higher uh, already. Uh, it may be back to 80% as Henri suggested. And maybe even 95% by the big bounce back, uh, mainly in the year 2021. So in most economies we expect pre-crisis levels of output uh, in the middle of um, 2021 uh, and then a return to normal by 2022. When you look at uh, inflation forecasts, uh, it's generally lower. Uh, and this is going to be an important point when we talk about emerging markets. So these are our forecasts as they are at the moment. Um, I'm now going to briefly talk about some uh, risks to uh, the recovery, to this V-shaped uh, recovery that I was talking about a, a minute ago. Um, it's clear that people are still afraid of contracting the virus. Um, as long as there is no vaccination, people will probably be cautious about uh, returning to normal. Maybe they will return to work, work, but maybe they won't return to play, as I mentioned before. So it's perhaps not going to be a V-shaped recovery because of that. Um, there are some polls, which I have here on the, on the right, which, uh, which highlight that. Uh, the one on the bottom right um, asks people, uh, are you nervous about leaving your home if businesses reopen and travels resume? Um, negative numbers mean that the majority of people are not nervous. Positive number means that the majority of people are nervous. Uh, again, interesting is at the very bottom, you've got India, where people seem to be extremely nervous about returning to business uh, even if businesses reopen. Uh, the best country here in that case is, uh, is Germany. Uh, another uh, risk to uh, swift recovery is that people don't trust authorities. Um, if they don't trust authorities, they're not, they won't be listening to them. They will protect themselves and they won't go shopping. Um, there, uh, the top chart is interesting. So there, it seems that trust in the authorities in India seems to be particularly high. So if the Indian government tells people to go back to work and to shop, people will probably follow. Um, and trust in Japan and in Spain seems to be particularly weak. So another perhaps risk there, depending on how well authorities did during the crisis, uh, it will very much determine how much activity returns thereafter. Um, we know that one trouble for many businesses will be that um, even once businesses reopen, they will face restrictions, social distancing, restaurants, for instance, uh, airplane operators will face restrictions. And it's not easy to see how some of these businesses will be viable uh, if they can only run at half capacity. So you may see uh, a delayed wave of pe people being laid off and of uh, bankruptcies in various sectors. And, and of course, there is collateral damage. So some sectors like my own, for instance, we feel like nothing's changed. In fact, we are working more than normal. Uh, but if the economy is tanking as a whole, we will eventually be affected uh, as well. These are immediate risks. A much bigger risk worry for us macroeconomists is that this recession, which is inevitable, which is already happening, turns into long-term depression. And that could happen if we get another wave of uh, infections because the lockdown measures aren't effective enough uh, in the winter, for instance. That would give us this W-shaped uh, recovery, or not recovery at all, uh, which would make everything that we've already seen increase in unemployment, increases uh, downside to the financial markets, uh, uh, bankruptcies and so on, uh, even worse. Uh, another key concern for us is, um, it is absolutely right that governments around the world are trying to absorb the losses to companies and households by providing them with unemployment benefits, with furloughing schemes, by uh, injecting cash into uh, companies uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and to some degree, I mean, I have the numbers here for Germany, UK, France, Italy, and Spain. That is, that is happening. If it isn't, though, and you can see in Italy and Spain, the fiscal absorption is less than half. So half of the losses still sit with households and companies. It means that these will end up with higher debt ratios, uh, and they will try to rebuild their balance sheets after uh, after the crisis, which will mean they will save, they will not spend as much as before, they will not invest, which makes this short-term recession into perhaps a long-term depression. Um, unemployment may linger longer than we expect. Uh, and of course, because the world is interconnected, if there is still weakness in demand, for instance, in the US, even though perhaps Europe has reopened, it means that uh, the, the recovery will be very slow. Uh, and finally, um, just like after the 2008 and 2009 crisis, uh, we cannot rule out that there will be follow-on crises. Um, we know that Europe in particular is vulnerable to sovereign debt crises. Um, Italy is piling up even more debt now 
uh, and we cannot uh, rule out that we get another sovereign debt crisis in the euro area. In fact, we think that is almost probable now, no longer just a possibility. Uh, credit crisis in the markets, if companies go bankrupt, if people can't pay their mortgages anymore, um, banks uh, will be on the hook and investors into credit products. Uh, political crises in Europe, again, where I'm based, uh, what we are worried about is that Germany will probably get out of this crisis quite well. Uh, Italy won't, uh, and that is going to create tensions uh, within the euro area and within the EU. Uh, and then finally, uh, as Henri already mentioned, everybody's putting up borders. There's a risk that we end up with protectionist tendencies around the world um, after this crisis, and that will take us a very long time to go back to the globalized um, international supply chains that we are used to. Before I finish, I'd like to uh, draw your attention to something that's not normally my remit, but I think a lot of people uh, will be interested. Uh, our emerging markets view here, because I guess many of you will be based in uh, these dynamic uh, economies. Um, I think overall, you have to say that EM are suffering two sudden stops in crises like these. One is in economic activity, as I've pointed out, and the other is in capital flows. Uh, in capital inflows, which are so important to emerging market economies. Um, but only one of them is actually unprecedented, and that's the stop in economic activity. The capital flows is something that emerging markets have learned to live with because it happens every once in a while. Uh, you'd have to say overall that the news on emerging market is bad, but not catastrophic. And one key driver of this is global risk appetite in financial markets remains high. And that means... Um, money is still flowing or flowing back into emerging markets broadly, which means there is no need for capital controls and there's no need for IMF support. That is crucial. That means many, most emerging markets should be able to get out of this crisis on their own devices uh, without having to resort to capital controls and IMF support. What helps is uh, that we see a big improvement in current account balances right around emerging markets, certainly compared to what we had in 1997, but even during, compared to what we had during the 2008 crisis. Uh, collapsing inflation, I mentioned it earlier, uh, inflation is down pretty much around the world and in most emerging markets as well. That creates monetary space. So central banks are cutting rates, are buying bonds, uh, and that is supporting the uh, economy. Uh, and also uh, low inflation allows real exchange rates to weaken, which um, means um, this, this creates a much more efficient environment to adjust uh, competitiveness when necessary than the usual volatility in FX markets. Uh, the one long-term worry th that we do have for emerging markets as well, uh, as well as for advanced economies, is of course the buildup in uh, public debt. For advanced economies, that's not so worrying in general because they issue reserve currencies, but as we know, that's not the case for emerging markets. So however, optimistic we are in the short term for most emerging markets, do not dismiss the long-term concerns here. And with that, I close my part of the presentation and I'm looking forward to your questions later on. Thank you so much, Dr. Christian, for walking us through um, this uh, insightful knowledge about how the macroeconomic situation is playing and also uh, the, that boost of confidence which you've given us for the emerging markets. I think that's very positive to see that uh, that the emerging markets play a, a good role and then they could use their own tools to come back from the situation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the question uh, and answer panel is open, so please feel free to ask your questions and we will take them on uh, as soon as our presenters have completed their presentation today. With that, so we heard from uh, a global perspective of Hydro from uh, Mr. Henri. Dr. Christian talked about the macroeconomic uh, situation globally and also touched a little bit about uh, the growing and emerging markets. So that gives me a good segue to, to welcome uh, Mr. Jomak, who's our VP for Asia, to give a quick insight about uh, how HBS is playing and HBS is working in the Asian markets. Uh, so with that, I invite Jomak to give a few uh, words of uh, how HBS Asia is transforming in this period. Over to you, Jomak. Okay, Arin, <clears throat> thank, thank you very much. Uh, good, good morning, or good after, afternoon to everybody. Um, I, I think, um, in Asia, that's that's not the first time that we. Uh, just, uh, hello. Yeah. Okay. So so in Asia, in Asia, we have been uh, maybe not to such a, such a magnitude, but um, we have been uh, several times exposed to this kind of crisis with H one N one, with uh, the MERS, 
uh, and with some unrest in some country. And and you know, as a as a, as, as manager, I think the the, the best thing that uh, we, we have to do uh, first of all is to is to try to put our people at safe in safe situation. Uh, applying sometimes the governmental measure or, or taking also the measure that we think. Uh, have to be taken to put to put the people uh, to people uh, in, in in the same situation, and, and then after that uh, we, we have to think we, we have to think about uh, we have to think about uh, the business and how we can uh, how we can mitigate the situation and and uh, and carry uh, and carry on to do uh, to do business, and this time this is exactly what we have done after putting our people at safe, country by country in Asia we are, we have. Uh, we, we have uh, we have tried to find the, the right solution to uh, uh, to to start doing business as soon as, as possible after this crisis because in all the country we have been obliged to to stop our operation like uh, Henri has said uh, today uh, we have 200, uh, 200 220 employees in Asia and everybody everybody is, is working uh, I would say not as as usual but uh, everybody is working and and we are able to uh, uh, to, to supply and, and to deliver our goods to uh, most of our to most of our customers uh, in Middle East and India, we have uh, we have 100 and 120 people. Our two warehouses, uh, one in Bangalore and the one in in, in Bahrain, are, are open and 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 running uh, running full speed, and we are we are able to deliver despite the, the difficulties for transportation. But we are we are able to deliver most of our customers. Our extrusion company in, in Kupam is going to reopen. Uh, is going to reopen uh, uh, early, early next week, and uh, here also we will be able to produce uh, and to produce and to continue to deliver the big project that we have uh, that we have won in the in, in, in India. So, uh, as Aria said, uh, April, April, uh, April and May have been very much uh, down because uh, we have been obliged to close some of our operation and then to reorganize the, our, our businesses and our processes. But uh, we are expecting, to, as he said, to be uh, to be at 50% uh, uh, of our uh, capacity in May and, and, and to go back to 80, 100% in June. So I think uh, uh, this is uh, this is where we are where, where we are today. Thank you, Jean-Marc, uh, for giving us an overview of the Asian position for hydro building systems. Yeah. And, and this gives us a good uh, entry point to invite our, our next speaker, Mr. Mahesh Aramugam, who is the Regional Director for South Asia for Mainhard Facade. And Mr. Mahesh is going to bring back a little bit of facade flavor into the discussion now. He's going to talk a little bit about how uh, his experience with complex facades have been designed. And he's going to walk us through a journey of how the facade industry and the construction industry in general in South Asia should bounce back subsequent to this current situation. With that, thank you, Jamak. And I now invite Mr. Mahesh Aramugam to take on the digital stage. Mr. Mahesh, the floor is uh, digitally yours now. Arvind, I think I unable to on the video. Are you able to? Yes, yeah. perfect. Okay, super. Okay. Can I share my screen? Yes, sir, you can share your screen now. I think good afternoon to all. Good evening to all and good morning to all because people are from the globe. I seen people are from US and good morning to them. Uh, maybe mid early good morning and good afternoon to India and good evening to forest people. First of all, I thank Technol for giving me this opportunity to speak in this COVID webinar session. And I immensely Look at the resistance around 300 people, participants or more. You know, we hit about 350s is a good sign of attending this critical COVID period. I'm audible, Arvind? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Okay, great. So, see, the evolution of complex facades is naturally is comes with a global sky, skyline architecture designed to engineering and to environment and the sense of identity. All the buildings, whatever today the identity and landmark for the respective countries are landmark buildings. 
look at 700 bc the seven wonders of the world happened up to 1931 ad and due to this post 1918 similar pandemic in europe and all over the world the wonders seven wonders of the world stopped in 1931 after that the one across the seven wonders of the world is the sydney opera house it is in 1959 and after that there not not much world of the world world of wonders wonders of the world is not in wikipedia or any landmark today not published yet we start by this you see human skeleton we call is a structure and we call the complete our mechanism into the body you know heart even all the body parts is become a mechanical electrical plumbing and it act like a building a mep and is the energy energetic performance mechanism same what we are in occupancy of in any building and as well as we are balance our body heat you know internal coefficient of body pressure and external coefficient of body pressure so we need some level of comfort between the temperatures uh, so we need a heat balanced comfort body so you need to sit in a very comfortable building designed for energy efficient and environmental friendly and sustainable and we need a full envelop aesthetics to meet depends on the zones and whichever climates look at this net ants nest which is similar building created this is a kind of complex geometries look at the birds nest in beijing which beijing derived a beijing olympic stadium so these are the com very complex geometries so coming to this time to time even birds do the nest in climate to climate the weather conditions and seasons you know the traditional paddy straw they used to do it in summer for better cooling and they make a green grass for winter winter and seasons and in deserts you know the birds create a nest with the overall thermal transfer value so they heat create a roof thermal transfer values to live in a comfort seasons so everything created with the complex geometries and which give a shading comfort and zones and is also is aesthetics and landmark coming to look at the car industry starting from 1915 and this started with the without a open car concept then with a the flat glass rectangular boxes then created some kind of model parametric model to wind dynamics aerodynamics and also in current scenario all the cars are in, in metal and glass the future car post covid 2021 is completely glass non breakable glass laminated which even if beam back it not break and is completely fiber they call e fiber reinforcement body cars so the industry is changing for the last 100 years post first 1918 pandemic and now we are stuck in the 2020 pandemic and I, so the landmark of the building is going to change look at this traditionally the all fire rises are like rectangular boxes and today and future is going to be all twisted facade or some kind of complex geometries that is a trend moving towards architecture patterns across globally see there are a lot of concealed structure look at the facade enclosures now nobody wants to have a come even millions of trans and they want to have a free standing glasses today even they want to conceal the cable inside the glasses so the industry is changing towards to conceal structures and more organic structures look at the shapes the left one is the thailand and that is only europe and below one is the in america you know the complete uh, envelope is changing into no grid no origin no directions also the the project which i worked in dubai in 2006 this project is not taken place with the sagagadi design and it was it is called dancing tower that time in dubai no regular grids the floor plates are shifted 50 meter away from the ground level so it's very complicated and challenging even lift vertical soft lift design is a compli complicated here so such a lean lift well is required even the facade you know is bent and dense uh, facades which is need to be 
lot of extrusion bending, sourcing, and a lot of stacks on detail, in the interface, interconnecting and interfacing with the two towers, all challenging details. Also today, the lot of membrane materials coming, adaptable and minimum structures, people want minimum structures, an architect go, even they give a chance, architect go without structures. That level of architecture is moving towards the globally today. And also there are a lot of double skins are due to global warming and the very cold climate, different conditions. A lot of projects using double skin, flexible wall systems and industry is changing. And also now the 3D curve, no more 2D curve, it's changing to new possibilities, unexpected origins and people want no flat panels or any rectangular shapes. The approach to complex facade designs or you know the traditional way of facade design, you architect provide a concept design and give a modulation to the architect, then facade design started and finish the documentation. Current scenario is going to be complex geometry, facade design is going to be changed. Even we need to add another step, modulation studies and complex geometries and panel uh, rationalization, minimize the number of types of panels, many things is go happen to economics point of view. I put about uh, the case studies of different types of 2D way of complex geometry facades. There are five types I'm going to present now, which done it about three projects in Middle East and two projects in India. So first of all, the fish scale facades you can do. Second is a step and strip facades. And third is a twisted facades. And fourth is a triangulated modulations. And Fifth is a cassette system types. And today, facades are, there is no grids. They have dots and their nodes and is, is going back to the era like uh, Rangoli or Kola, I mean, what do you call South India's? So, and also today, the same Rangoli in the elevation, they want with the facade integrated lighting. So there is no vertical and horizontal line. There is no straight line. There is no flat line. Everything going to be changed to complex lines and complex geometries, there is no unexpected origins. Coming to this project, you know, the three fish scale jobs, one is the, in Sweden and one is the Dubai Park Plaza and Park Plaza and another is a um, Crown Plaza in Dubai. So we are taking the, we done this uh, Park Plaza in Dubai. So this is the um, tower is completed and operational in the Western city of Dubai which is a 60 story floor, double curve, twisted, and you can see the color rendering on the panel, the typical panel, non-standard panels and typical panels and different types of panel sizes. And set up point of the curve changes on every floor. Is the typical floors are the not same floor plan. The radius below and you can see in the red line and radius above on the green line. So they changes every floor and you need to plot the radius spring point point and curve set out moves along the lines. So you have to identify the difference between the above floor and below floor, then only able to prevent the, to prevent the trapezoidal panels. When you end up with the trapezoidal panels, you end up with the 30,000 panels. So we have planned to be limited to 10 types of panels. So we need more rectangular panels to get it done the geometry. So this is a maximum warp studies, which is analyzed in Excel sheets and take the coordinates from the panel modulation and the floor levels to the levels and the x-axis, y-axis and z-axis and put all the values into the each and every panels out to streamline and we identify the maximum warp is around 55 mm. Based on that, we plot the panels and we minimize about eight types of panels. All the colors are different types of panels. So all rectangular panels created this geometry instead of trapezoidal panels. So, but then going with this kind of 10 types of panels, you need to end up with a 10 types of extrusions. To prevent that, we kept one million, one type of million, one type of transom, and we created the gutter sleeves as a adaptable. Even male, female million, the adapter we change about three, four extrusions. So we eliminate nearly 80 extrusions to narrow down to 20 extrusions. So then you need to have in this incline adapters, 
and in, this is a rendering image of the inclination of the to create the curve so these all panels are standardized about 3000 panels and balance panels are in another types so all these integrated and installed so you see this is a 55 mm warp on the warp on the center of the glass so the glass panels are pulled in and pulled out and achieve this geometry and this is the project completed above is the completed images of the project so there's a lot of system advantages flat glass no design or warranty issues you don't need to have a curved glasses even joints are jagged not uniform so system determinant is a complex joints requiring more aluminium but panel size is not in uniform so joints jagged not from jagged and not uniform and partition walls interface is a bit complex so all this considered coming to the next step down strip facades these are three types of project one is in london the city hall and another one is a sound tower in dubai and another one is a novelis these are the three references for the step down strip facades so we are taking the case studies on the sama tower in dubai you look at the this is a 50 floor tower twisted but in floor plate wise look at the floor ground floor this is another trapezoidal at the 50 percent of the floor reached to 25th floor at the rectangular and above 25th floor to 40 floor is exactly mirror of the ground floor so how are we going to study we study the options glazing line runs between the extremes of the slab maximum offset is about 440 mm required Hazard zones always varies. So we change the sex. We study the option two. Glazing lines are parallel to upper slab edge and is about 608 mm offset and is varies again cranked and glazing line parallel to the slab edges that also come to the 440 mm. So we took the 440 mm option uh, to not recommend it because you have to go with the stick system. So installing, installing for such a tall tower is not easy. The, for such a tower, you need a unit ice. So we choose the option two. And the option three, you have to go for semi unit ice. Then you, is also installation and scaffolding and other thing requirements. So we possible option is option two. So we choose the option two for unit ice and design the parameters. The problem with the unit ice, the corner conditions are meeting the trapezoidal into changing form about 20 floor you need to corners need to be addressed all other areas you can create a flat panels but the one additional difficulty here is the sunshade need to be added so we play with the corner panels there may be one or two the last two corner panels we play we keep one plane as it is and we kept the other elevation to twist the geometry so that is end up with the, like an option two and we, we can't project the slab also because we need to enclose the facades. So the option three adoption we maintain with the prevent the shop acidic corners. Also the details we integrated by offsetting the panels to get the geometry in and out in terms of stack join at the transom. The advantage that the architect provided a sunshade here. You know, so the fin, fin sunshade. So we integrated the below floor and above floor into the, the sunshade. So you can see the below the bottom image where it is executed with the two different stack joints shifting floor to floor. And the advantage is a flat glass, no design or warranty issues, simple cost effective solutions. And the system is a slow to install, but is a fully unitized. And the other steps are large at the ends of the building is adding a cost. Otherwise, all other 80% of the facade area is a standard flat panels. No no deviation anything so his cost has been saved more than 30 to 40 percent coming to the twisted facades we have three references here one is in new york one is in netherlands and one is one is in uh in the middle east so we taken these ocean guides as a twisted which is done very complicated and challenge every floor rotates look at this floor shift five floor is every five floors the floor rotate about 500 mm every floor is a 50 mm so every 10 floor we need to change the rotation so we and also we need to have a 
you cannot have a cold bend or twisted glass. So we managed to cold bend this glass after panel fabrications. So again, we done a geometry analysis and studies. Warp panel is about panel width is about total maximum warp. We get around 16 mm and we divided by the uh, width of the panel. It is coming around 20 mm. We did a studies instead of that time there is no parameter. You talk about in 2000 and 2004. So we are the only option to go like this way of studying the warp studies and panel modulations. Optimization need to be done for the twist and other things. Here also we studied options. Option one is a whole panel warp, which is glass stress and glass distortion is there. Warrant is issue, minimum aluminum cost. Option two is a spandrel warp, balance all rectangular panels, more glass stress, less glass distortions and warranty. Again, is a minimum aluminum cost. Then again, panels are completely uh, fish scale. Each and every panel you need to step out to ship this 500 mm recess rotation. So we choose the option two to, sorry, we choose option one, so we can stress the glass. So we did the analysis on the glasses. So we put a stack joint wires, you can pull and pull after fabricating the panels during installation, you can pull the panel to stress it out and lock it. So the shape can be turned 50 mm, 50 mm on all panel and 10 panels you can achieve 500 mm. So such a way you see the stressing happening, cold bending at the site. So only disadvantage is a warped glass, warranty must be ensured. So you need to be heat soaked and install the glasses. So QAQC testing required for each and every panel. The disadvantage is the most simple cost and very fast, very difficult to fast install because every panels are full to position for 50 mm. You have to carefully, gradually pull it, otherwise glass may break. So pulling, cold bending the panel, fabricated panel 50 mm is a not easy, easy stuff, uh, task, but we tested maximum and maximum size of panels and maximum number of panels and the project get it done. Coming to triangulated modulations, these are the few reference projects of triangulated modulation globally done. But I'm taking a small project in India where we did a, a triangulated model study, which is this is a building in uh, Gurgaon in Delhi, where we did a completely 2D rendering with a reflected way of seeing the building and top view of the building and all directional view. So we plot the geometry in the plan and we did a plan set out between the below floor and above floor and we created three curves and radius varies between below floor and above floor. So curve is centroid and warp, warp surfaces. So again, we did a plot studies. So you cannot install a triangulated panel floor to floor. So how to get it done? So we did a complete studies, how much panel going in. So this is, you cannot cold bend or anything these are because it's too curved. Only way you can do trapezoidal panel, standardized trapezoid panel because angle versus panel size and panel joints. And also perimeter varies. It's not a standard perimeter. Every floor, the perimeter varies. So again, you need a sim simple four-way joint. Panel cannot be shipped and fabricated at flat. So you need to have a, some kind of diagonal pyramid trapezoidal panels. So only way you can do floor ship by hoop on brackets. And we again, we adopted a mullion center profile where you can turn around the radius. Batching this, this kind of geometry we plotted, we identified and the panel can be installed like this, floor to floor. <laughs> also the cassette system, the TCA Sirseri tower, is about tested for 9 kPa. We have five geometries and 17 meter cantilever of the glass and the roof trellis is cantilever another 12 meters. It's all together about 30 meter cantilever. And we did a trapezoidal panel model study, mullion modulations, elevations, because five elevations in the five views and five shapes and five geometries. So it's a complex four-way joint required and we achieved with the panel cannot be shipped and installed it flat. So what we did for such a 70 meter cantilever and such a things, we identified about six types of triangulated and trapezoidal panel modulations, but 
all need to be integrated flow to flow connect because it's inclined so we gone for a avoid the triangulated modulations we gone for trapezoidal modulation because the triangulated modulation you cannot install for such a 32 degree inclinations so we did again the floor radius studies and above floor radius studies because every floor about 8 meters projections and this is what we did of all geometries integrated into five geometries and we pull out the radius where it reaches <coughs> and we did a made a one envelope of five geometries so by this every flow you can standardize one trapezoidal panel so that way panels are minimized to three types for all five geometries and we achieved this as a cassette system and integrated so this kind of geometries we created five geometries the corner panels only come in a triangulated portion all others are going to be trapezoidal panels and we don't need pen individually and need to consider indi individual connection and details for each and every panels and we did this kind of detailing especially this entire tower such a candle where we are 90 mm deflection and residual deflection has to bring down to 13 mm so we did a wishbone strut joint with a double bracketing so it allow the building sway and the lilo deflections and the panel to prevent panel cracking or scratch noise it completed in 2016 fully functional and is a completed images of the five geometries is stand elegant from and from facing the bay of bengal and it was to two cyclones heavy rain flooding and without any zero failures as of date coming to the from 2d to 3d i just touch up on three slides where the industry is changing today because you know when i started working 1987 there is no auto no cad computer we all manually drawn and in 2000 2d cad come in 2008 3d came and today is become parametric with people are playing with a complete parametric 3d modeling so i just want to touch upon that what is how it works See today evolution of three complexes. There is no horizontal vertical plane. Unexpected origin. You need full cam cad integration required. So even this picked up from the aircraft industries and other industries. The modeling is a free form. I am integrating a roof and facade together to a free form facade roof. So look at this. There is a two horizontal line, transverse and longitudinal base lines. This is a step one, and step two, you create an architectural curve. what exactly you want the roof pink color is a roof and the general general trick is a facade and the direct trick is the roof and which is a boundary line we created of the building is a step 3 and you seen the surface generated with all panels flat the next step when you enlarge this the panels are look like this the flat panels integrate into the geometry and is a optimization required rationalization required and is a post grid making it, making it fine you need to streamline with the parametric optimized panels rationalization to minimize the number of panels minimize the number of types of panels so we need to deal with the rhino and grasshoppers and integrate with the excel sheet to bring the panel modulation to get the fine grid then after getting the fine grid we need to cut the shape of the surface along the trim line of the buildings we can see the above the building shape is trim this is 50% of the building is trim, trimmed at the roof and final surface and it is facade glazing integrated onto the 50% of the roof final surface and grid of the 50% of the building then you just mirror it you get the full building view and this is the final rendering of the project it comes with the roof skylights and integrated facades so the today is a parametric gone to this level this is bit complicated i'm not so these are reference and samples we created to tell where the industry is going next few years this is a parametric is going to be 
a key for future facades and complex geometries. So coming back to Dr. Christian spoken very well about the facade finance and psychological bouncing back in post-COVID, but I have given a target to speak because I'm a management, management graduate also. So they given me a task. So I also presenting some kind of how we overcome the COVID situation globally. See, Wuhan is a world's factory and Wuhan could be province capital, is the epicenter of the crisis, is home to some of the world's largest computer factories. And Wuhan makes around 90% of the world's 300 million computers a year. You can say every country, is, at least every village have one computer, that level the computer manufacturer from Wuhan. And world largest auto component makers, the 70% auto spots are coming from Wuhan. And 70% of the 2 billion phones and 80% of the 110 million air conditioners manufactured and sold globally from Wuhan. And world's first origin of COVID is from Wuhan. Moving to Wuhan COVID, it downed the automotive sector 23% globally. In India, it is about 46%. Power sector is down to 18%. And IT sector is down to 17%. And food FMGs, you know, food industry is down to food and beverages down to 16%, and healthcare down to 9%, and telecom down to 3%. And is globally impacting, is the global figures. Coming to impact of the global. See, today the strong dollars cut are post COVID. This is a March, 17 March statistics. Currently, the U Europe and Japanese ends on the positive side, less than 5%. And all other economies are gone in a red zone. The Mexican is the top hit of 15%. And we are falling around 3.8% in India. Look at the impact of the global economy in terms of GDP. Major countries are all are in negative direction. You know, the US is marginal from the last three years. China gone from 6.9, but India is a heavy impact more than a percentage. Now with people of the market, I saw the McKinsey report and few reports recently to how to improve the business. It, the, everybody is projecting 4.5 to 3.5. So, the other markets also in negative approach in GDP. Coming to China slowdown, what expect significantly impact various industries in India and globally. For example, automotive India is 34% impact due to China slowdown. The chemical is the highest hit. Even chemical means pharmaceutical and other chemical industries about 129% hit. All others are around 15 to 25%. And biggest is the textile and apparel industry is about 64% hit globally. And the, globally, the aerospace industry is commercially 46% hit. Air and travel, hotel accommodation industries are gone, hospitality industry gone to 44%, oil and gas gone to 42%, and automotive globally 29%, and insurance and finance sector gone to 29%. Negative, all are negative. So how we bounce back and coming back from the COVID-19 and what is what are the approaches for us? Reality is unknown, is unexpected origin and plan for solid eventualities. And you need to, what is the opposite of the eventualities? You have to think it of and you is the beginning and is the causes and you need to commencement and origins and plans and source yourself and start to move on post COVID. By moving that, what is your approach? You are spiritually prepared to overcome this crisis, socially mingle and keep distance, and you have to overcome this post-COVID crisis. Physically, you have to fit, and family-wise, you have to together and get it done. Personally, you have to be strong, and professionally, you have to move forward in a very proactive approach. 
that lead to you for success on the post covid approach and awaken in this covid 19 how you awaken yourself what it is and what it is not future focused is inspirational or clear and focused or align with your culture and values or convey state of being or emotional or unimagined this is what it is and what it is not you can't easily achievable anything post covid you can't easily achievable anything easily measurable and you can move on or what it is not means go even you cannot easily goals and objectives can be achieved short term oriented or short term meaning is very difficult in this post covid and series of projects you can't expect with tough competition ahead maybe earlier you bid for 100 projects you end up with the 10 projects biddings and tasks are heavy and you need to more detail even you plan more detail also still this is not sustained for you, you need to very carefully plan and move on things are not what they seem you thought that you can see the mirror mirror mirrors of pools of water looks in the heat way with during you drive in the car you thought it is a water you can swim is impossible in the post covid so what do you what you have to do object in the distance that appears on thing but is not really true so you have to very hard work and overcome this covid 19 apply your view between the nature and science to overcome the situation that's what Albert Einstein theory stands to the everlasting credit of the science that by acting to, on to the human minds and he does over room more commands insecurity before himself and before nature coming to balanced approach how we balanced approach you have to go along in parallel in a straight line with your heart and mind for your success if you not balanced you will be suffer and overcome this covid 19 is not easy and between the minds for best decision making don't narrow down or not not lock down one side you know we have a two brains left brain and right brain these are the between the minds these are the two colors resembles of the left brain activity and right brain activities so you can create the info processing by process info in a linear manner and non linear manner so both don't focus on linear but you have to focus on non linear you take the best of the both also you have to take the project engagements in a very definite manner and important details to be addressed and see how the result with the clarity on this also the perceptions how you going to take it analytical per perception or creative per perceptions both you need to balance and move forward and your workflow what is your workflow move in a sequential order or direction or and move ran randomly both so you don't go with the random and don't go with the sequence so go with the both balance and go also use logic to solve your problems and use intuition to solve your problems i take on this logic in the next slide the logical success from the post covid 19 how are you going to overcome the logic success see we have two left hemisphere and right hemisphere of the brain your logic as to in line with personality you keep your personality and forget your logic very difficult you are very strong in math but you need to be more creative with the math you are language language good in language but it will be intuition and reading and music together then only you will get a good music writing a uh, writing or you good uh, good handwriting but you need a art is to spell out with a good writing so analysis with the special abilities you can overcome on this covid 19 post covid 19 between thinking process you don't be a single minded approach be a multi angle analysis and approach then only you can overcome this covid also when you dream you can overcome this covid situation will create and deliver for your future coming to your vision confidence with the other's vision confidence you have to very careful with your vision what do you trying to sell or what do you trying to do the business it should be a reality post covid so what you have to do you have to be cannot be static you have to have a dynamic solution to overcome this situation to make it reality in the post covid 19 
coming to the success cycle after covid 19 machine to machine is a connectivity human to machine is a autonomics service life cycle is your knowledge and your human to human is a collaboration so all this put into to together using your knowledge in the post covid use your data process it content it and connect it and be autonomics and collaboration and be success after post covid 19 and also i take to post covid 19 what is the world shift towards to localization as dr christian very clearly said and even our um, technology team also said is going to be localization no no more globalizations because the heavy impact is become a dependency and interdependency so you need to have a digital gets a real push and your cash is a king for your business so liquidity is a key in this current post covid move towards to variable cost models don't stick to your traditional or whatever your standard cost models it will not going to help you you need to have very management and accounting cost models to overcome this post covid also building sensing and control power capabilities are required otherwise psychologically will be down and supply chain resiliency is key now because you know every port to hundreds of ships parked every airport runways or aeroplanes are parked every the logistics is today key so your supply chains will be resiliency is a big key so you plan your supply chain now because 100% logistics operation by sea or air or surface transport is not going to happen immediate is a huge impact is going to happen post covid and building agility to overcome post covid 19 is not only to our local is global you want to export you would completely adopt this then only you overcome you required a pre planning much earlier not yesterday so you had to plan for next 30 days today so this is the post covid situation because the industry to back to normal take a year or two then between the year one or two you have to plan very seriously and systematically to overcome this post 19 covid see the leadership also is a key to act across the five horizons after covid 19 there is no leadership is very difficult to overcome this covid with your employees and things so what do you have to resolve your resolve address the immediate challenges post covid represents to the institution or work post or your customers or technology or your business partners resolve all the matters and what resilience so address near, near term cash management challenges liquidity issue broader resiliency issue during virus related shutdowns and economic down knockdown effects so plan your resilience upfront now and return create a detailed plan to return to business how are you going to back to scale quickly because so many hurdles are on the on the line and the virus evolves and knock on effects become clear so you have to be focus now and you have to back to scale quickly very detailed macro level planning required to overcome return into the business and reimagination is a key reimagine reimagine the next normal way of life which is not easy what is discontinuous shift looks whatever discontinuous happened to the covid 19 you you shift back to look like the implications what are the implication you going to face in the next years and the institution should reinvent so you have to work hand in hand with the authorities governments and reimagine things and propose and suggest and move forward and that required a lot of reforms be clear about how the regulatory and competitive environment is in your industry may shift i don't know depends on whatever industry you are there your supply chain or solution based industries or <coughs> sorry or service based industries to overcome this leadership i just showing you the all hours i already shown five i am putting another six hours for you to overcome restore your energy revive yourself run yourself result oriented yourself rise yourself be rich and be royal in next 3 years post covid 19 and opportunities in india and globally plenty 
now is opportunity for india and global for the forest markets where accelerate make in india develop components and ecosystem to enable and complete manufacturing rather than just assembly you trying to assemble and wait for the parts current logistics and situation from other countries not easy not possible so plan now for manufacturing the components rather than sourcing for it to assemble it manufacture for global markets not plan for your local market then quickly plan for the global markets when you plan now plan for global market and use for the local markets and encourage exports work on advantages like lower labor india has lower labor one third of the china skills availability sets skill sets are available plenty in india so you can utilize and you can use the same for global perspective and i put this please approach to all all of you and again i am saying please what is please psychologically flexibility is required otherwise you suffer you need to leadership and lead quality to overcome this covid 19 and you to be enhanced and energetic in the business and you action changes things so act to change the things and overcome this covid 19 and sustain through your style if everyone has a style if you develop your most style you will overcome this covid 19 and evolve and enrich yourself for the well being to save the world and you save the economy and save the country and save globally and we can beat it together covid 19 globally with all the countries and globally together in hand in hand and we have to thank our, to all the doctors and nurses and health care staffs to overcome this covid 19 situation i want to everyone to pray and thank for the global health care team and doctors and nurses and health care workers and i leave my presentation here and questions can be organized and arranged by arvin the moderator arvin and isha so i thank you everyone this covid 19 situation hopefully next week all come to work and i wish you i pray and wish you all for success from post covid 19 and overcome this situation thank you to all thank you so much uh, mr mahesh for your uh, i would say a combo presentation where you walked us through the facade and the complexity of the facade and how it's evolving and also a very nice positive end to how to address this covid situation with that i invite all our panelists to come back on uh, on um, on screen i would like to now uh, introduce to our Uh, guests and uh, attendees our moderator uh, for some special question we've been being poured with many questions uh, i would request now uh, mr sam robinson our managing director for hydro building systems middle east in india to share some of the questions which has come through on our q and a tab and take this forward along with isha over to you mr sam and uh, isha thank you arvind good afternoon uh i would like to thank all the professionals who is on live with us for this webinar and uh, my special thanks to uh, dr christian and mr mahesh and of course to our president uh, and john mark uh, we have just thought about you know uh, in this situation uh, there are plenty of questions in everyone's mind how this how uh, the situation is going to be today tomorrow we are all living in a uh, very uncertainty situations so as a panelist today we got a variety of people and uh, i would like to start my question with dr christian uh, it is uh, you know that many countries especially in the emerging market building and construction sector is one of the backbone to uh, the gdp as an economist also associated with the bank how do you see the construction in the industry evolve after covid 19 and what could be the bank's role for restarting after the uh, covid 19 and the second question also to you how important the government in this every country wherever we are living in uh will give a stimulus package because normally governments they give a stimulus package to the industries and not mainly given to the building industry so do you feel that 
government also have to look into this industry where there are plenty of uh, blue collar employment is generated. This is very, very important industry, but it is not uh, really uh, given that importance by the local governments. How do you see that in your, in your view? Uh, yes, thank you for these uh, two questions. Um, on the uh, import, well, on the role of construction um, in the lockdown uh, and in the recovery, um, you'd have to say um, that construction is not one of those industries um, which is most impacted by the lockdown measures. Um, and that's because social distancing, at least in most um, construction sites, uh, is is easier than in you know retail trade settings, um, and it depends less on people traveling from one country to another. Um, although, um, as I think Henri mentioned uh, before, you know in London you have the example where uh, Polish workers can't get to their construction sites at the moment. And indeed, if you look at uh, the data that the UK produced this morning, construction does seem to be one of the sectors which is impacted um, roughly in line with the average at the moment. But if you look at Germany, for instance, that's not the case. And I think again, Henri mentioned that uh, Germany seems to be doing quite well. Um, so as the industry is not as affected perhaps by the lockdown measures, social distancing measures as, as others, uh, the, the initial decline in um, output is going to be smaller uh, and therefore um, uh, the need for recovery will also be smaller. So it may not be sort of at the focus, I'd say, of um, policymakers um, at, least, um, at least initially uh, when it comes to to stimulus, um, so that you know, moving on to the second question, I, I guess, uh, you know, right now, if you look at the stimulus packages you see around the world, you know, you get a lot of attention to the U.S. Um, measures or European measures, but even if you look at um, what what we know about fiscal responses in um, in um, in emerging markets, where you know a lot has happened, um, so far the focus is not on stimulating expenditure at all. Um, whether that's on consumption, you know, private consumption, or whether that's on investment, which is very important for the construction and the building industry, of course. So far, the fiscal response is concentrated on making sure that people still have an income, so unemployment uh, benefits, furloughing schemes, uh, and it is focused on companies not going out of business, so lending to companies, um, but perhaps bypassing sometimes the banking sector if necessary, but certainly these guarantee, loan guarantee schemes that you see uh, right around the world. So, so far the response is not on demand stimulus, it's on keeping, you know, supply in place, keeping workers uh, paid and keeping companies in, in their business. But that's going to change, I think. You know, once uh, the lockdown measures end, once people can work, I think there's going to have to be some uh, demand stimulus. And infrastructure, as you mentioned, is, you know, always a favorite for policymakers right around the world. Um, you know, when it comes to uh, buildings, mm -hmm. I guess there will be a new normal, right? I mean, uh, we don't know how um, office space will be used in the future, where people will want to live. I think that was mentioned in one of the previous um, uh, the presentations. Again, I think Henri mentioned this, you know, people may not want to live in small uh, downtown apartments. They will want to have a bit more space, which means they may move outside the city. So there will be changes. Uh, and, uh, you know, my advice as a supply sider is always for governments not to interfere too much with that, but to leave it to business to sort out where the best place to construct and to build will be in the future. And when it comes to bank support, you know, I'm, I am working for a bank. I'm not a banker. Uh, I'm sure that banks are deploying whatever help they can to employees, and they do play an important role uh, in, in this. But I'd refer you to my colleagues um, who, um, who are the specialists and who are more than happy to follow up on Citi's particular support here. Okay. Thank you very much. It's a very, very elaborative answer, and uh, thank you so much. Uh, then my next question to Mr. Mahesh. Yeah. Uh, you are in this business for quite a long time and an expert, lived in many places across Asia, and now you are heading the Asian region. How do you see the construction sector, particularly facade industry where you are specialized, uh, to uh, behave after COVID-19, spe specifically from the client side? You know, how do you see that the industry will go forward. Will there be like uh, a different mode of working style, something? See, the Asian perspective would take uh, 
at least one year or two year to back to normal at least two years uh, because current projects are some are under construction some are under design some are under completion stage so this over in this business over the fresh they won't start over the people under construction they may not start the next job until this completed this job and wait and watch the market how it behaves so it take two years to back to normal that's what my personal feeling so in between there is a move people who are invested already in off way through they definitely they need to complete and uh, get back their investments whatever under planning maybe they try to reduce it or uh, whatever they plan the budget maybe they try to cut here and there to come back to run and move on the project whatever on completion sheet definitely they complete find a way to complete and hand over but overall is next two years a big tough market and is a hard to come over come this covid post covid 19 so after two years definitely india market has a big potential because you see there is a shifting focus as dr christian said and is going to be localizations so definitely the market will large economy you know like india or uh, uh, other parts of the world where more than a trillion economy definitely flourish but other economy also grows uh, depends on the population wise and economic point of view the respective countries okay that's a good uh, but two years is a quite long time huh? uh, i think industry the way how it is behaved that uh, this we need to see in building industries at least 3 to 6 months yeah that's what i said the, the two years period is you won't expect any major changes you know whatever people on going jobs will try to complete what are going to be completed need to be completed and whatever new project design maybe they scale down rather than going into full swing okay thank you mr mahesh and uh, my last question uh, to uh, john mark as we are from hydro building systems how can we ensure the consistent supply chain during this type of crisis and we have done now past 15 50 days so how we can go forward because still that uncertainty is uh, everywhere yeah well, f- f- first of all first of all uh, as i said we hope that uh, the worst is behind us uh, you know that in in europe uh, it's also true uh, in asia but in in europe i think uh, most of the uh, most of our operation have been uh, are been blocked uh, uh, i would say from from mid of march to uh, to uh, almost end of april uh, and then uh, people were working from home we were not able to produce uh, to produce uh, any extrusion uh, except except in germany uh, we were not able also to get uh, some of our components from from our suppliers but uh, it looks like since uh, since the beginning of the month since the beginning of may we have been able to restart the operation reshuffling our factories because to uh, to to cope with the uh, social distanciation and then uh, we have equipped the people with mask and uh, with uh, visors and uh, specific uh, specific uh, uh, protection so we are, we are i would say almost uh, at at a normal uh, level of production today and uh, as as ari say we expect to be able at eight, to be able to be at 80% at the end of the of this month and uh, and to be uh, well i would say uh, almost 95 to 100% in june so uh, really uh, we 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 believe that if we are not uh, uh, if we are not going to be confronted with this uh, w uh, crisis that some some people are unfortunately predicting i think uh, we will be we will be back to normal uh, at Uh, the uh, in, in June. and it's it's the same in asia i think uh, if i talk about china china uh, now in, in china it's almost business as usual but the, the construction sector has as we start the days is as we start slowly i think uh, we, we are we are not yet at this uh, at the full at the full capacity in the construction in southeast asia i think uh, we, we are based in singapore singapore has been locked down uh, and most of the the prior of extrusion which are not in singapore have been locked also until uh, until the beginning of the month but now we have started also to produce normally and we are able to deliver uh, to deliver our our customers 
uh, and you know the situation really in Middle East, uh, in Middle East and, and India. Uh, Middle East uh, has not, I would say, not been too much affected. We have, uh, we still have, uh, still able able to produce in Middle East and to, and we have a big stock, so we are we have not disrupted too much, uh, too much the, the business and the customer. Uh, exception of the the problem of traveling and uh, for us in Bahrain to to go across uh, across Saudi, but uh, you find some good work around and. Uh, We've been able to deliver in Dubai and India. I think we are very much tightened to the decision of the government. So we are ready to start. The only thing that we are not ready in India is to travel. We cannot cross the border between between the different states, but this should be uh, this should be okay on Monday. And and from Monday, I think we can expect uh, well maybe not business as usual, but we can expect expect to do uh, to do business. So I, I truly believe that uh, that the worst is beyond beyond be behind us, and that uh, we will now. Uh, be able to ramp up uh, our, our our production everywhere, including Europe. And I was discussing with Henri this morning in France. Uh, uh, I think we are at uh, we are already at, at seventy percent of the production, which is uh, which is quite good because one week and a half ago, I think everything was stopped. So, uh, and but there will be a lot of learning from from this crisis, and a lot, lot of learning and a lot of changes also in the way we are going to work, and uh, what. Uh, Everybody's all, all, all the people were saying today is I think working from home is becoming is is, is going to become something also more usual than the, what it used to be. Okay. Thank you, Jean-Marc. Now uh, my last question to all the panelists, uh, especially uh, it is your recommendation and advice to overcome the current situations, if any, to the professionals who is on live with us. Mm -hmm. Starting from doctor. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I guess, as uh, has been said before, we, we have to get used to a new uh, normal. Um, you know, there's uh, lots of consequences for businesses. There's lots of consequences for how you run your family. Um, I think uh, we, we all uh, know that. Um, and it goes into all the way into politics. Um, I, I think we just have to be ready for change. Um, we have to uh, adapt, we have to stay alert, um, and that's what I'm trying to do. Thank you. Is we are reborn after COVID-19, you know. And we and we are to meet all challenges of, after this post-COVID. And we are to is a new era, completely new era. You know, people, I feel this. COVID-19 taught a lesson globally, and even it taught a lesson to people what is discipline, and taught a lesson to people what is the good, how, how you overcome struggles of the business when you are in problems, and it teaching everything. A tiny dot is invisible dot is teaching everything to from each and every human being in the globally now, and definitely it helps the global economy to revive. And everybody will hard work and overcome this post-COVID, Sam. Thank you. One thing also I would like to say that there are plenty of people who have uh, just restarted enjoying the family values during yes. this COVID period. You know, this is very important. We have lost over the period with all our, uh, you know, busy schedules, travelings. Many a times we never you know, taken care of so many things. But today we could see that what is family and that values. There is also uh, an important lesson. I was I was chatting with my wife uh, a week ago. She said after uh, marrying uh, 25, 22 years, they only, this one month only were having three times of food in home. <laughs> <laughs> so you, your health is improved in three in a homely food and i think people will uh, get the awareness of health conscious also from here you know yeah and people will that's, live long the we right. pray for the people who lost their lives we pray for them and we pray for the people who will from over succeed from this covid live long yes john mark to you yeah, I think um, many things have been said, but I, I truly believe that there is there will be a before and after this this COVID crisis, of course. Uh, uh, but uh, don't don't believe it will be uh, 
dramatically different. I think the, the, the main principle of the economy will remain. Uh, I just hope that the way we are going to look at the things and the importance of the things that, that we are going to give will be will be a little bit different and then uh, giving more priority to uh, to help to family to, to to the others so i think if only we can achieve that i think it will be a it will be a, a, a good for a bad i think uh, so uh, I, I hope will things will be will be different i think uh, and the way we are going to work will be obviously different i think uh, the uh, evolution in the, in all the digital communication uh, I think we'll get a strong push from this crisis. That's uh, that's that's very obvious, and uh, I think this is maybe for the good if it uh, if it's allow us to travel a, a bit less than what we used to do, and uh, that will be good also for the for the planet. So we, there will be uh, there will be a lot lot to be taken out of this crisis. I, I hope we'll be able to take uh, take a lot, take as much as as possible. Okay, and don't forget. Uh, not to forget uh, what has happened and, and continue as uh, if nothing has happened. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John Mark. Pisha uh, and Erwin, is the right time to take some of the questions from the our professional who is in live? Uh, uh, yes. Pisha, could you take a lead, please? Yes. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, dear panelists. It was really very informative and interesting to hear you all say about your views on the current situation and of course the complex facade from mr mayesh is always exciting to hear we have a lot of questions pouring in for the panelists which are live these were the questions uh, that we took from the, uh, the the direct questions that we got from the emails so now we will have some live questions uh, i would like to start with the dr shulz Given that the emerging economies will still have a positive GDP growth rate as opposed to the GDPs in the developed economies, do you foresee an accelerated flight of capital from the developed to the emerging markets in the next few months? Um, I, I mean, first of all, I, I wouldn't read too much in the, you know the relative uh, forecasts here. Um, you know, we're okay. still in a in a in a stage where nobody really knows how bad the impact on each economy is going to be. My impression, to be honest, is that the that the the virus is hitting all countries, whether rich or poor, pretty much in the exact same ways, and that by now, pretty much all countries are also reacting in the same way as you've seen in these charts of social distancing or mobility. Uh, and therefore, I also think that the GDP impacts are going to be quite similar. Um, but the important point that you make is, you know, how uh, do we recover uh, from this? I think, um, uh, you know, I'm quite confident that advanced economies will, um, by and large, recover quite nicely. Um, but the important point is, um, you know, all this money that central banks in the West, the ECB, the Fed are currently creating, is going to reach for yield is going to look for higher returns and these returns you find in EMs right so in, in emerging markets and um, and therefore you know as long as countries in the emerging market world are you know dealing with this crisis appropriately um, I think there will indeed be a, a, you know more money flowing into EMs um, and it may indeed be a, a, fl a flight from uh, from the rich world to the to the to the emerging markets uh, and which will boost growth there. So yes, I mean, I think in general, we're optimistic there, not for every country, but in general, yes. All right, and just continuing on this, uh, what is the general perception? Do the economies have uh, more promise uh, by doing manufacturing locally, or if it is, it's more promising if the FDI pours in? Well, I mean, we were talking about the new normal uh, and, you know, one, thing which we, of course we're observing is that um, you know, during this crisis there were supply disruptions which um, make governments very very worried about uh, global supply chains uh, and not just governments but also companies so you you are going to see a a you know which had already started before the crisis because of the trade wars and everything you, you're going to see a re-onshoring of production um, to uh, to to some of the you know the markets where the consumers are so the US maybe Europe um, to, to some degree, which is obviously not good news for um, uh, most emerging uh, markets. Uh, at the same time, uh, we have seen between different emerging markets at various points, um, what we call tra trade diversion. Um, so for instance, before the crisis, when China was hit by US tariffs, we saw that some production was moved from China 
to further to the south to, to Southeast Asia. Uh, now that we see some Southeast Asian countries still hit by lockdown measures, whereas China has already come out, we're seeing some of that production going going back. So there's not just you know between uh, advanced economies and industrial economies, there's going to be some shifts at least temporarily, but also within the uh, emerging market space, it's quite uncertain how exactly these trade flows will look uh, in the future. All right, I guess it's the time which will tell us uh, the exact situation in coming months. Thank you so much, Dr. Schultz. Uh, I have another question from Sir Alexander, de Sil Alexander Silva. In terms of building shapes and heights, why should the industry consider keeping high building high-rise towers while the home office, the new normal way of working is providing to be more effective. Mahesh sir, maybe you can answer this. See, the, you repeat the question, sorry, I will raise it. See, uh, in your presentation, you showed a lot of high-rises and complex uh, facades, large volume office commercial spaces. So why should the industry keep on building these kind of uh, spaces, the commercial spaces, when the new normal way of working, that is the home working, is providing to be more effective? Do you think it is going to change or to keep on going? It, it, will be, yeah, it will have some changes. You know, now the IT sector, the people are learning and there is a, people are working from a month from home, you know. The, but this can help to some extent from uh, backward uh, working from home, you know, from what you call the uh, backward home, office. home work. But in the front end, you need uh, office spaces and anything on uh, spaces and commercial driven areas, you know, mainly financial markets, consulting knowledge based sector definitely required office space. But on the IT sector, you can work from home. But major high rises are more towards commercial, financial sectors and uh, other markets, trading sectors. But coming to uh, working from home mainly happen in IT sectors, not in these commercial towers. See, okay. a visitor, a business visitor want to come. Uh, they have to come to commercial space only. They cannot come to your home for a business discussion, right? Yeah, makes sense. Correct. Yeah. Never thought about it like that. So definitely, <clears throat> IT sector, yes. There are some impact that people work from home. It depends on the company to company and how they organize and arrange this. But coming to trade, finance, and other sectors, we required a office space for business to evolve. And OK. OK. So uh, coming to the very critical question for the times right now and all the difficult times uh, uh, to come. The players, uh, do you think the players in the facade market will, res uh, will resist to the temptation of cutting corners for reducing costs in the hope of faster recovery of the losses? Or, and if, if, if it happens, if some of our competition, be yours as MindMart or be ours as central building systems, if uh, if, uh, if they cut corners and if they react in this way, how are we going to sustain and how, how do we as the building systems uh, may probably survive this and how are we going to react to the situation? Maybe Mr. John Mark can start to answer this. Yeah, well, I think uh, c cutting corner from, from, from the market situation, we, 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 uh, we are used to that. I think, uh, I think when we are, we are dealing with main contractors or with uh, with uh, yeah, with the, the professional in 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 the, in the building uh, construction, I think uh, we are always uh, we are always uh, in, confronted to the to the competition. So uh, I don't think that uh, the COVID situation will uh, will uh, will make the, the the contractors to cut to, to cut more the corners. I think uh, I, I don't know if the market goes down. The, 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 Obviously, the competition will be uh, more exacerbated. So I think uh, we might have to, uh, to do some efforts, but uh, but I don't see uh, I don't see tremendous change in, in the way the market are going to behavior to 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 behave in, in in front of the in front of the competition. Competition is the competition. I, I think the competition will be more affected by uh, the dropping down of the LME, of the dropping down of the oil price, of the rising taxes in uh, 
in in uh, in, in Saudi, for example, uh, than than by the, by the COVID itself. So I think I don't uh, uh, I don't think so. I think I did, maybe Robin, you have also some ideas about it, but uh, I think competition remains the competition, and the market uh, and the market rules uh, are still always the same. I think uh, so. I don't I don't see any. Uh, any consequence on, on the COVID, on the way the markets are going to behave, to be honest. See, yeah, Jamak, I think normally there is always a pressure on prices in such situations. This is like, you know, the clients or everybody, it's like human psychology yes. just to take an immediate use of the situation. But contrary to the actual perception, it is other way around. Like in this type of situation, the prices of material, it is not the commodities, it makes the difference. Now, today the oil price is so low, but doesn't mean that I can use the oil because there is nobody to use the oil. So what is the benefit to the governments even? So the same thing, even LME is low, but if there is no market demand, it is not the commodity is deciding the factor of any, any, any final cost of any project, whether it's in the industry or in facade or in building industry. So people, what they tend to forget today, uh, if you see, there are plenty of people they are going back to their own countries. And after mm -hmm. one month, you may find a very much uh, less people to work. Even in mm -hmm. our industry, it is always blue collar uh, job. Today, people are taking an immediate action of terminating jobs and there are plenty of job loss, but this also is going to push up the job. So if, even if competition, if they take an immediate uh, decision on pricing the, you know, cut down the prices, I'm sure that uh, it is not a long-standing strategy to, uh, it cannot be a tactic to survive in this type of situation. Yes, yeah. there will be a lot of pressures. We cannot deny it. Yeah. Uh, but this is a very short-term approach from the, from the owner side as a buyer. But as a seller, we need to be, always we will be having tremendous pressure. You can see that prices of many items is going to, even starting from the mask. Mm. The mask was sold at maybe in cents, Today at what price? So it is. It is the same thing, you know. Yeah, I, I <laughs> so, think one one of the outcome of, of this kind of crisis is that uh, what we say it's it's also some time cleaning cleaning up the market. So uh, and uh, in in such condition, people are also looking for safety. And and uh, uh, there is uh, I think uh, there is some. Uh, good things belonging to, to a strong and multinational company uh, sometime because uh, we, we are we are able to, uh, to to give more more safety or more confidence sometimes to the players also in the building constructions i think uh, that can be uh, that can be also one one of the advantage of companies like uh, like hydro that are that are solid solid companies so i think we are giving some reinsurance uh, toward, toward the market only the future will say. Coming okay. uh, to Mahesh, sir, uh, the same situation, you know, you you are mostly, the consultants are mostly under the tremendous pressure from the developers, the client side, that, okay, uh, reduce the design, compromise on the design, whatever, you know, cut the cutting corners per se. How do you react? How would you react to it now? For Till now, we know that you do not compromise, but uh, now that the pressure is going to be intensified, how do you think you're going to react? when the situation comes. The, most of the thing, the finishes can, there will be a cut to corners, but you know, design is design, engineering is engineering. There is no short cut to it, right? So they cannot dilute on this tool. So only the finishes are some kind of finishes they can reduce and wherever the cost, they can balance and complete the project. So because of a, this enclosure of the building, energy performance, and uh, comfort required. So definitely they cannot cut corners on these three, plus design and engineering. Balance whatever they want to play, they can play. You know, even they want some portion, they want to plaster and paint the wall, they can do that, not issue. But coming to be, uh, to have a landmark building, when they invest a building, they cannot end up with the plaster and paint. You know? Right, right, okay. So people, tenants, tenants or anything will not come. You're right. Okay, so I'll just take uh, one last question uh, and it can be directed to John Mark and Mr. Robin uh, equally. Yesterday we had a long, uh, I mean, longish short uh, 
lecture by our Prime Minister, Mr. Modi, and he was talking a lot about localization and being atmanirbhar atmanirbhar, which means being self-reliant. So he was urging the Indian masses to produce locally, consume locally, and be just self-reliant in every aspect of consumption. So how does the uh, hydro building system uh, you know, play a part in this? Since it's a general perception that the, that the MNCs are here to, uh, to, you know, they're just here and they're importing and things like that. So how does the hydro building system in India play a part? I think it's a it's it's a it's a quite sim simple answer and complex at the same time. But uh, I, I think uh, everything we do has to has to answer to uh, to some uh, to some logical equations. So uh, if we have the capacity to produce locally at the same with the same quality at a lower cost, uh, and if we have the quantity to do it, I think why why should we uh, why should we uh, avoid to do it? I think. Uh, we are already doing it in China. We are already doing it in, uh, in 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 India. When the local market is is, is big enough uh, to to support local localization of of the production of uh, of uh, some components, uh, why why shouldn't why shouldn't we do it? I think. Uh, uh, but so, sometimes there are some markets which are requiring specifically product coming from Europe. So having having the production in Europe is also for us very important. So. I think everything has to answer has to answer to the to the to the local demand and to the demand of the market, and then uh, our our duty is to uh, is to answer to that. In in our industry, I think uh, the the the, uh, the the production of aluminium is very local. It's always local because I think it's it's very economically it makes sense. Okay, well, we are we are discussing and sometimes we are bargaining regarding the uh, the accessories or the hardware or these kind of things, but. Uh, but sometimes, if it makes sense, and we have, if we have the same quality uh, producing locally than than uh, importing from Europe, I think why should we, uh, why should we avoid it? Just let's let's do it. Uh, Mr. Robin, uh, would you like to add to this? Yeah, just to add that one, uh, we are a global company, but we are very much locally present. Uh, if you see, like uh, in Middle East, for example, uh, we. We have a very good supply chain in terms of uh, managing such situations. We are not even stopped our operations at all. Still, we are managed to, to supply during this full time. We have uh, plenty of extrusions company uh, placed in different countries in the Gulf. It is uh, smooth as long as uh, there is borders are open. And even if there is no borders are open, like uh, we are able to ship to uh, some by seas and we are managing it. In India, we are more, more, more also like uh, we are the one of the only system company as an international company has our own extrusion plant in India. Uh, so we do support what has pre PM Modi has announced yesterday. And in addition, we are already existing and we are in, in that line. It is not only our extrusion company. We got our own more plant in Pune, which is doing for automobile, the precision tubing. And our biggest uh, IT uh, head office, uh, you know, the biggest uh, people working in IT for Hydro is also in India. So it is more of like a local company. If you see as a presence, we have 120 people, Middle East and in India. So mm -hmm. this itself shows how more we are just, you know, diverse in terms of a global company to a local situations. And this is one of our main success of our business over the year. And uh, Middle East, yeah. we are presented for almost 45 years now. And in India also, it is more than 25, 30 years. So it is, it is that itself a testimonial to your question. I think we are already yeah. there. It is yeah. nothing new for us. <laughs> and and, and, <laughs> and, and uh, I think that, uh, that, uh, that the people in, the, in our central procurement, uh, which, is, which is in Europe, uh, are going also to look at the procurement with with uh, different highs, and, and not only with the uh, the the only component which is which is the price. I think uh, what what this crisis will teach all of us is that uh, uh, price is one thing, but the sa safety of the procurement is something else. So I think sometimes it's better to have a different procurement source in order to ensure that in case of such price, then you are you are you are still able to uh, to procure what you need. 
So uh, I think uh, we, we will we will need a little bit of time to digest all all, all these teachings, but uh, I'm sure it will have some some consequences. And uh, even and procurement, the way we are going to procure is going to be different uh, after the crisis and, and before it. This is two different things because even still we can manage from the like Middle East to India, India to Middle East. So these are the possibilities we have because we got our own warehouse about fifty thousand square feet available in Bahrain and even in India also we got a quite big warehouse. So it is it is always then we have in Southeast Asia in China. So this is good thing also when you are dealing with the global company because we have many different parts of world we have our own manufacturing plant so we can source this out, source also from there it doesn't mean that you know when you are in india it is then it is we just became ourselves very close now here we are talking about as a we say global you know we are just global and local so we can merge together and we can bring always when any of our customers partnering with us they will never have this type of disruptive supplies during this type of situations we will we will find the solutions for them. This is the assurance I can give to our customer and to our clients uh, during this period. And we have done in 2008, we crossed, but it was not the global crisis. Now, even now, like past 50 days, we are very much on business and uh, we will be there always. And there are a big team around us. It is not only me. And there is you, Arvind, and there are 120 people around us in the Middle East and East. India. One last question to doctor. There are many questions from Middle East. Uh, just I need to ask that one. Uh, how there are plenty from UAE, especially and from Middle East, Saudi Arabia. How do you see the recovery uh, from the COVID situation, especially in UAE and in Saudi Arabia? It is, it is, you know, plenty of questions related to that one as you know, also you are just some sort of associated with the bank, probably they are asking more questions towards this one because, you know, bank support in this region for this industry is very, very much uh, necessary yeah, to I, restart. I guess, I guess it's not only about COVID, but it's also maybe about oil price and so on and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it is. So please, if you could give us some one last input, uh, that would be great. Uh, yes, I mean uh, the I mean the forecasts for uh, UAE, which I looked at, um, are minus four percent this year, plus four percent next year, which you know compared to what we have for emerging markets on average is worse, um, I'd say, and I guess that's not surprising, uh, given the um, impact of. Uh, uh, the oil price uh, on the industry in these countries, uh, as well as on tourism, on transportation, all of which are sectors which this, this country uh, is specializing uh, in. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it's worse than the rest. At the moment, the numbers look not as bad as um, uh, industrialized economies. Uh, but um, as I said, I would not compare too much the forecast for one country versus another. Um, it, you know, it's, it's a kind of a path dependency um, in there, so I wouldn't compare that too much. But yeah, at the moment, the forecasts look worse than for EM for the emerging markets as a whole. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, I think we have just crossed time uh, because we've uh, ex extended uh, to more than two hours now because the discussion was so engaging, was so thoughtful, was so powerful. But you know, gentlemen uh, and ladies, uh, when you were doing this um, conversation, I took a poll uh, in the background and I asked the people, how much time do you think back to business normally will take? And uh, more than 60% of them have said between three to six, uh, six months, they are very positive and confident that the business will be back to normal. And that's the human sentiment and the human emotion, which is fantastic, which is very overwhelming to hear. I also asked them, how is their business sentiment right now and post COVID? And a whooping 50% said they are confident and positive. And I think beyond economies, beyond supply chain, the human resilience to this situation is going to overcome. And I'm praying uh, with the help of all you, uh, wonderful industry professionals together, we can combat the situation and overcome COVID together as a human resilience is always done. 
the human uh, uh, human uh, has seen many pandemics and this is also one of them and we will overcome this together with that i would like to once again thank all the panelists for taking out some time uh, maybe i will just like to conclude with all of you maybe one word of confidence for this human spirit would be great and then we can uh, we will call it the day so i will start with uh, dr christian one word uh, for all of our uh, listeners and attendees and then we will take it along with mr mahesh jomak and robin and isha as you said humanity has been through worse things and i think we would get out of this um if we work together thank you dr christian mr mahesh I just unmute you one second. Yes. Okay. This situation is after 1918. You know, we're facing after uh, 180, how many years? Maybe 180, 100 years now? Yeah. Yes. The second in pandemic. And we have to be together and proactive and hard work and overcome for better prospects. Thank you, Mr. Mahesh. Mr. Shomak. Oh, you know, I, I will I will make it quite easy. I think I will I will just use the uh, the care, courage, collaboration, values of Hydro, and I think uh, uh, I think it's uh, if everybody follows these these values, uh, we will get out of this crisis uh, in 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 a better in a better shape than before. Robin. Yeah, I am also with the poll of our audience. Three to six months. Yes, it is difficult, but I'm very positive that uh, we will come out of uh, this current situation. And of course, maybe the change, it is from us, we need to start. Uh, it is how quick we are going to adapt to the situation is going to bring the success. That's it. And everyone stay safe at this moment and be positive and future is for us. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Isha? Well, um, everything has been said. And I also feel it's like the world is rebooting. Some files will be lost for sure. But then when it, the reboot is done, we'll be stronger than ever. So again, stay safe. Thank you so much. And thanks all the panelists. And really, thanks a lot to all the audience who stayed with us, who were so interested in the conversation. And we have a lot of chat uh, a uh, box saying that a lot of thank yous have been pouring in all uh, the way to all your uh, all the presenters they they are all thanking you for your time and your energy and uh, the information that you have shared thank you so much once again arvind thank you isha so thank you isha thank you arvind before we conclude ladies and gentlemen we have all of these recordings available on youtube so there is a qr code you can scan this right now and that will lead you to our youtube page it's called techna live please like share and subscribe this page and you can keep get uh, information about all of our future and past activities as well um moving forward your feedback is so critical for us it's been a wonderful journey this whole month we've been having different conversations different topics so as you exit today's browser you'll be leaded to a survey page please give us your feedback to us it's so critical for us to improve and give you better and better content and uh, hopefully this digital communication will continue as uh, and evolve into also more closer interaction with both of us with that i leave it with our contacts if you need anything any more information some q and a's have not been answered but we will pass the questions to our panelists and we will request them to answer them at their leisure and we will definitely get back to all of you we had a wonderful audience today 350 people plus uh, and a big thank you to all of you taking out time and uh, listening to all of us today it's a fantastic show and to our panelists once again dr christian mr mahesh jomak robin uh, isha thank you so very much for taking out time it's been a wonderful pleasure to host all of you and we look forward to hosting you in our future webinars with that it's arvin and isha and all of us from hydro signing off thank you very much and wish you a restful restful thank you very day. much to all thank you thank, thank you bye bye take bye -bye. care be safe bye bye, bye, -bye.
going to stop recording.